Oh, wow. How'd they get up here? <laughs> that's, that's from mud. Oh, BBS. Oh, BBS. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, good morning. Good morning. <laughs> This morning in the reading of our psalm, we are in Psalm 27. So let's all stand for the reading of the psalm. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for a glorious day. Thank you for yet another opportunity to worship you. Lord, may your name be exalted. May you be lifted high here today, Lord. We love you. We thank you. We look forward to what you're going to do here today as we worship you in spirit and truth. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Psalm 27, I'll read the odd-numbered verses, you read the even. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. One thing I have desired of the Lord, that I will seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret place of his tabernacle he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, Therefore, I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take care of me. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, this morning, let's wait upon the Lord. Let's worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? Amen. David, let's worship the Lord. Amen. Good morning. Hallelujah. 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 Your love makes me sing. Changing love is a mountain beneath my feet. The love is a mystery. A legion they left me when I am surrounded. Your love carries me. Hallelujah! Oh, Rising, I can feel it rising. The joy that's growing inside of me. Every time I see you, your goodness shines through. And feel this God song rising. Every time I see 
Trust in you. We pray this morning that your grace and your mercy just flow down on you. Who breaks the power?
is a lamb who stays. Worthy is a king, conquer the grave. it is everything it is about everything that you've done for me and for each and every one of us Lord it is about that amazing grace that mercy Lord that you show us time and time again oh Lord and even sometimes when we don't know it because you send your angels Lord to watch over us to take care of us Lord even in those times when we don't realize we need the help you are there Lord, and so we pray that this morning, Lord, as the truths are taught through your word, that we would hold on to your truths, that we would hold on to your strength, oh Lord, to your love. And we pray that your word would be loud and clear in our hearts this morning. We open our hearts to you, oh Lord. Do that work in our lives as you guide us, as you lead us, oh Lord. We will trust in you. And in your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Praise God. He is amazing. This morning, if you are visiting for the first time, we want to give you a warm welcome, but we need to know who you are. We'd like to know who you are, so would you please raise your hand, raise it up high for a few seconds. Anybody visiting for the first time, we just want to welcome you this morning. Praise God. There's a hand all the way to the, to the back in my right, all the way to the back on my left over here. Anybody else we might have missed? All right. Take this time to greet each other. Do it with the joy of the Lord in your faces, just like this. Good morning. morning. We have a few announcements before we get into our morning Bible study. If you have a cell phone, please take a second and double check that it's on mute or off. We don't want any distractions during the teaching. 
Today, after service, we have a lunch on the lot, uh, chicken teriyaki bowls, and the fundraising is going to go toward the youth mission uh, retreat in Mexico. So please uh, come join us after service for lunch on the lot. This Tuesday, July 15th at 7 p.m., we're going to have our Christian Basics class, and that's a class where they teach uh, to, to help you know what you believe and why you believe it. So if you haven't taken that, highly encourage it, or if you know someone that's a new believer or just needs that further grounding in the Word, uh, please uh, join us for that. Uh, all you have to do is sign up in the sign-up sheet out in the lobby so they know how many um, booklets to prepare. Next Sunday, uh, July 20th at 2 p.m., we're going to have our church water baptism. Great time of the year to be baptized, but we know that as believers, we need to make that outward proclamation of our faith. And so if you haven't been water baptized as an adult, we highly encourage you to do that. All you have to do is sign up on the sign-up sheet. There's an instruction sheet right uh, below it that will give you the directions of where the location will be. Festival of the Glory in Mexico, the mission trip in Mexico, that's going to be coming up. We're going to have a meeting for that mission trip this Tuesday at 6 p.m. So uh, please uh, join us if you have an interest in missions. Uh, the Mexico trip to, or the mission trip to Mexico is a great way to get your feet wet in missions, get some experience and see how there's a whole world out there that needs the gospel. So uh, pray about joining us for that mission trip. The men's retreat is right around the corner. It's going to be August 22nd to the 24th. It's going to be in Brinehead, Utah at Summit Mountain Lodge. That's where we had it last year. A great time of fellowship. Get to know the other men in the fellowship to be able to uh, have iron sharpen iron. The theme this year is Be Strong, the Lessons in the Life of Joshua. So please sign up for that. You could sign up at the bookstore. Payment in full will be due August 10th. Also, the ladies' retreat is going to be in September, September 26th to the 28th. And so uh, please, ladies, pray about joining in, uh, in that conference. It's going to be at the Calvary Chapel uh, Conference Center in Merida, California. And so the, the dates, again, is September 26th to 28th. Uh, the deposit would be uh, due July 27th, the balance on August 24th. Also, lastly, we have the DVDs now for the VBS. And so if you want to purchase a DVD of the VBS, the Vacation Bible School that we just had, uh, you could do that in the bookstore. They have those available. And with that, let's pray for the morning tithes and offerings. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for gathering us together to worship you. We know that this is a worship service, and we come here to adore you, to praise you, to thank you, Lord. We know, Lord, your word says, Lord, that the earth belongs to you and everything in it. And, Lord, we just want to worship you now in our tithes and offerings, Lord, acknowledging, Lord, that, that everything we have, even our very lives, belong to you. Receive our tithes, tithes and offerings, Lord, multiply it and use it for the advancement of your kingdom to bring your name glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, good morning. Glad to see you all out this morning. If you have your Bibles with you, why don't you open them up to 2 John. This morning we're going to look at two short little letters, 2 John and 3 John. Uh, it's important that you be able to read this for yourself. So if you didn't bring your Bible, we'd love to loan you one. All you have to do is raise your hand. The guys in the back will come bring you a Bible. And when you get it, just open it up to 2 John and you can follow along with us. Kind of excited because we're edging closer to the book of Revelation. Woo, yeah. Be, be there very quickly. Uh, but uh, this morning, uh, very important study, Second and Third John. Good stuff for us to know. Uh, a lot of wisdom for us to understand uh, in our ministry and fellowship with one another. So let's go, Lord, in prayer. Ask him to bless our time. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the things that you have in store for us this morning. Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would speak wisdom, that you would speak clearly, Lord, the things that you have for us. Father, for those who know you, Lord, that you would strengthen us, that you would show us your will for our lives, and Lord, that you would direct us in how to implement those things. And Father, for those who don't know you, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself, grant them forgiveness of sins, eternal life as they put their trust in your son. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, my friend Claude is a, a little bit confused when it comes to religious matters. He always has been, never has been able to quite uh, get, a, get a grasp on, on, on the truth and you know, he, he kind of church hops depending on what he's looking for. Uh, the, the other day he was feeling really guilty and he figured guilt, I'll go to the Catholic church, you know. Uh, you know and, and so he, he, he went to the Catholic church and, and when he walked in the door, he saw the confessionals over on the side and he said, ah, that's what I need. I need a good confession to deal with this guilt I'm, I'm feeling. And so he went into the confessional booth and, and he, he said to the, priest and you know forgive me father for I sinned the priest asked him what he'd done and and Claude said well father I I done stole some lumber and the father said well well how much lumber did you steal my son and Claude said well I I done stole enough that I built my coon dog a nice dog house with it and the father said well my son that that doesn't sound too bad and Claude interrupted him right away and said well, well that's not the whole truth father I, I done built my dog uh, a nice dog house, and I, I done built myself a four-car garage with that lumber, too. And, and the father said, well, now that sounds a little more serious. And, and Claude interrupted him again and said, oh, father, I, I, I can't lie to you. Because I done, I done built my coon dog a nice dog house, and I done built myself a four-car garage, and, and I built myself a five-bedroom house with the lumber, too. Now, now the priest was in total shock and, and, and responded, now, now that's really serious. And uh, for your penance, you're going to have to make a novena. Well, a novena is, uh, you know, the Catholic Church is a nine-day serious prayer and fasting time of, of repentance. And, well, Claude didn't know what that was either, so he responded, my father, I ain't never made one of them novenas, but if you got the blueprints, I got the lumber for that too. <laughs> John's second and third epistles are very different from the epistle of eternal life that we spent the last several weeks looking at, 1 John, but it's still very important in that it deals with several guiding principles that are often overlooked in the church in, uh, that are important if we're going to walk together in a way that pleases the Lord. These are... Uh, principles related to uh, church fellowship, real church fellowship in the family of God. Now, 2 John is written to a, a Christian lady that is apparently a friend of John's, and he instructs her, uh, answers her question on uh, how the church is to handle false teachers. And uh, 3 John is written to John's friend and a fellow minister named Gaius, and it takes kind of the opposite approach. It doesn't address so much what to do with the false teacher, but it deals with a pastor who won't receive the real teachers and uh, basically uh, uh, treats them wrongly. And, and so uh, in, in both of these letters, John gives us uh, nothing but the truth. He says in verse 1, the elder, 
to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth. Now, uh, we know that the elder is none other than the apostle John. Why does he call himself the elder? Well, the, the word elder used here is the Greek word uh, presbuteros, which uh, has two meanings in, in the Greek. One is that of a church position, the elder in a church, you know, the, the, the leader of a church. And, and then the other one, and, and the more commonly used word uh, meaning of presbuteros, is an elderly person, uh, an, an old man. And uh, the, more than likely, that is the term the, the definition John is using here. Why do we believe that? Well, one, because he never uh, calls himself an apostle. His apostleship, his leadership's not being challenged here at all. It's just uh, he's being asked uh, a question as a wise man, as somebody who knows something. And, and so uh, he, he is the term elder, uh, when it's referring to an elderly man, isn't just speaking of someone who is old in years, but someone who has the accompanying wisdom. Not everybody that's old in years has the accompanying wisdom of being old in years, and he does. He says, you know, he's an, he's an elder. Another reason we know that he's an elder is because at the time of the writing of this letter, John is in his mid-90s. He is actually, uh, he's, he's getting every senior citizen discount available anywhere, you know. He's, just, he, he's been around a long time. The other apostles are all dead at this point, uh, martyred, and uh, he's the only one still around. So answering the question of the elect lady, he does so as one who has been around the church longer than anybody else in existence and knows how the church is to operate, how it's supposed to work. So what was the question of the elect lady? In those days, there were men who traveled from town to town as itinerant prophets. It was a, a common part of the church that these prophets would come to the churches and they would prophesy in the power of the Holy Spirit. They would edify the saints in the word. They would build up the body of Christ and then they would move on to the next church, to the next town. The problem that arose in John's day is that along with these traveling prophets, there arose a whole movement of false prophets. These men would blow into town much in the same way, but they would do so to take advantage of the hospitality of the congregation. You see, the congregation was responsible, the church was responsible for caring for these itinerant prophets. They would take them into their homes. There wasn't a holiday inn you could go put them up at. They would stay in your home and you would feed them and, and, and provide for them. And then you, you would provide for their journeys down the road as they left. But these false prophets thought, hey, there's a great way to make a living. And, and they came in and started prophesying lies. And, and so this elect lady wanted to know if the church's responsibility was to care for these itinerant prophets was it still the church's responsibility to care for these itinerant prophets when they were shown to be false? When they were false prophets, do we still have to take care of these people? This was such a problem in the early church that the early leaders of the church actually had to write a book instructing the churches how to deal with itinerant prophets, how to tell if they were real or if they were false, how they were to behave, how they were, they were to conduct themselves while they were in town, what you could expect of them. The book is called the Didache, and, and we still have copies of it today, D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And it had very specific instructions on dealing with false prophets or how to know if you had a false prophet. If a false prophet stayed more than three days, it said, He's false. Don't uh, send him on his way. He's not, he's not real deal if he stays in your house more than three days. If the prophet prophesied that the family was to prepare a great meal and he ate of it, he was a false prophet. You know, if he came into your house and said, oh, I'm getting a vision. Sirloin ribeye, ribeye, thus saith the Lord, fix me a ribeye on the grill. 
and a big baked potato and bless your traveling prophet. Now, if he ate of that, he's a false prophet. Now, there were prophets who came to town and did prophesy that the family should prepare a meal, but it was usually for the poor. You know, thus saith the Lord, prepare a meal for that family who just lost their house in that fire. Prepare a meal for that family that, that, that he just lost his job. Pre- prepare some food for that lady who just had a baby. You know, that, that, was, that was healthy, that was good. But if that prophet prophesied prepare a meal and then took advantage of it, then he was a, a false prophet and he was to be shoot along his way. John is writing before the writing of the Didache to address very basically how to deal with these false prophets. When you knew they were false, what do you do with them? Some say that the elect lady he's writing to is none other than that, just a friend that's a believer, an elect lady. Others say that it's a lady named Electa, not to be confused with Electra. Electa is the Greek word for chosen, which is that word translated elect in your Bible. And and so he was writing to a lady named Electa. That's a kind of a cool name, right? Hey, Electa, you know. But no reason to believe that. I mean, some just say that's probably what it is. Who knows? Others yet say that John was truly writing to the church and that the elect lady was a code word for a church in that town. Her kids, her children were the members of the congregation. And if you read what he's saying, there's, you know, probably some, uh, uh, some truth to that. It's possible. These were days of intense persecution in the Roman Empire. And, and uh, you know, if, if somebody got caught with the letter that was written to the elect lady, then everybody would think, oh, it's just a personal letter he's delivering, and they wouldn't go looking for some church in the town by following that guy. And so uh, maybe that's true. There's no reason, and there's no, uh, no indication on Paul's so on John's side, that that's what he's doing. So uh, we don't have any need to go there. We can just say that the elect lady is some elect lady. And just like he said, because whether this is a family or a church body, the principles that he's communicating are principles that apply to us as individuals in the church, as families in the church, as believers in the body of Christ. And, and so either way, it doesn't matter. And we'll just treat it like she's... Uh, some lady. That fan's cycling again. I think it's time to buy a new thermostat. That thing's just a piece of junk. That's what happens when you buy a low bidder, you know? <laughs> but the, John says he loves this lady in the truth, as all believers do, those who have known the truth. The truth being referred to here is God's word. It's the, it's, it's the word of God, the Bible that's being talking about, talked about here. God's word is truth. Now, don't get confused here. Uh, God's word is not the only thing in the world that's true. But if any other thing contradicts God's word, that thing is false. God's word is true. It's the pillar of truth, the foundation of truth. He said, uh, Paul, writing to Timothy, said that it was God's desire that all men should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, that they would come to believe God's word, to take him at his word regarding these things. Later, he called the church the pillar and ground of the truth. The church is built on the word of God, and, and, and we are the, the ground of the truth. We, we're, our job is to protect the word of God, to, to, to keep it pure, and to walk in the truth by believing in the truth, by taking it to our heart. Now, truth is a key word in John's epistles in 2nd and 3rd John. You'll find it four times in 2nd John, five times in third John. And you'll notice in both letters a direct link between love and truth. Love and truth go hand in hand. That's an important connection because there are a lot of things out there that people are calling love that aren't. Love is always grounded in truth. If it's not grounded in truth, If you have to lie to say you love, then there's room to question whether it is truly love. 
Love is grounded in the truth. They go hand in hand. Because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. That's the one thing you can know about truth. It endures forever. Jesus said in Mark 13, 31, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. So John says, grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. There they are together again. Now these are the common greetings of the New Testament epistles, grace, mercy, and peace. Most of the epistles have uh, grace, and, grace and mercy. Uh, there's two or three of them that have grace, mercy, and peace all together. This is one of them. Grace is God's unmerited favor to you. It's, uh, grace is getting what you don't deserve. When God gives me grace, he's giving me something I don't deserve. He's blessing me when I don't deserve it. Mercy is kind of the opposite, kind of the Siamese twin of grace. It's not getting what I do deserve. God gives me grace and mercy. I, I, that's what I pray for, by the way. I pray for mercy. I never pray for justice unless I'm praying for the other guy. And it's like, Lord, mercy. I don't want justice for me. I don't want to get what I deserve, Lord. I want, I want mercy but for them, justice, you know. It's like, Lord, give them justice, those bad people, you know. I'm real quick to pray mercy, justice for others. But I'm all about mercy. I'm all about grace, too. I love God uh, giving grace and mercy. In fact, when you get grace and mercy together, you get the result, peace. Peace with God because of Jesus Christ. Because I have peace with God, I have the peace of God in my heart. I, I don't have that inner tor turmoil anymore. I have, I, I'm settled in my heart. I, I'm right with God and everything's right in me because of it. And because I have the peace of God, I now have peace with the world. I'm not at, ang at, at odds with anybody. I'm not, uh, I'm not all uptight about my relationships. I'm not trying to get anything from anybody. Because I have the peace of God, I have the peace uh, peace with others, and, and so I have all-around peace because of God's grace and mercy. I rejoice greatly, verse 4, that I have found some of your children walking in truth as we received commandment from the Father. And now I plead with you, not as though I wrote a new commandment to you, but that which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. Now this is the really the central principle of the entire New Testament. This is the central command behind everything that composes Christianity. Jesus said in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, there's a standard, that you also love one another. By this all will know that you're my disciples, if you have love for one another. This is really the, the heart of our Christian walk. This is how the world recognizes us as disciples of Christ. And tragically, this is an area where much of the church is failing today. This is an area where uh, quite often the church lacks love. Quite often the church is cold. You'd never know that we're disciples of Christ when you look at the way some churches treat other churches. When you look at the way some believers treat other believers, the world looks at that and thinks they're no different than us. And they have a hard time believing that we are actually disciples of Christ. This is love, he says, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. See, John says we should walk in this love. Not just any love, this is the word agape. We should walk in this agape love toward one another. It's a self-sacrificing, other-centered love. That's what agape love is. Agape love is that unconditional love, that, that love that you have for, for others, whether they deserve it or not, that love that's not dependent on what they do for you. There are some people that are so easy to love, and, that, and that's a no-brainer to love them, but there are others that are not so easy to love. There are some that make it difficult to love them. 
They walk around with porcupine barbs all over them in a sense so that you can't even you can't touch their lives so you can't get close to them and and it's hard to love certain people but really our call to love others has nothing to do with how they treat us the command to love one another is not a an if then command if they love you you love them back no, it's not an if-then command. It's a direct command from the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of anything else, says the Lord Jesus, you love them. So when you have that unlovable person in front of you, then what he's saying is, hey, I'm giving you supernatural power to love that person. You love them no matter how they treat you. You love them no matter what kind of jerks they are. You love them anyway. That doesn't mean you have to you have to hug them. Doesn't mean you have to you have to cuddle them. Doesn't mean you even have to be buddies with them to love them. Hey, when I work with the police department, I love the people that we arrest on their way to jail. They don't get out of going to jail because I love them. They still go to jail because I love them. Best thing I can do for them and the people that they hurt is put them in jail. And so that's not that's not unloving. I just. Don't hate them while I do it. I don't, I don't attack them while I do it. You know, and that's, that's what love is all about. Love is unconditional. It's to be something we give, even when we have to be disciplinarians, even when we have to enforce rules. We can still do it in love. For many, oh, I'm sorry, this is love. That, oh, I already did that one. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming into the flesh. Now he's addressing these false prophets that have come into the church. He's traveling deceivers. He said they're deceivers that have gone out into the world and don't confess Jesus Christ as coming into the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. Now remember a couple weeks ago when we looked at 1 John chapter 4 in the beginning of the chapter and we, we looked at a very similar statement John made in chapter 4 verse 1. He said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they're of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. Now hold that thought right there. Has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Now John here in our text, says something very similar, that these deceivers have gone out into the world and that they don't confess Christ as coming in the flesh and that these deceivers are part of that spirit of antichrist that is in the world. But there's a very subtle yet very important, significant difference between what John is saying here and what he's saying there in 1 John chapter 4. And you see it in the Greek more clearly in that in the Greek, it says that they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh in 1 John chapter 4. But here he says that they don't confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. A future statement, not a past tense. In 1 John chapter 4 he said, you know they're false if they deny that Jesus has come in the flesh. Now he's saying in 2 John, you know they're false if they deny that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. They're talking about the return of Christ for the church. And, and what's interesting about that is that that is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses do today. They do not confess that Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. They believe that he came in 1914, that he established his kingdom on the earth in a secret basement in New York, a Jehovah's Witness headquarters, and that he is no longer coming back. His return next time will be a spiritual return. He's not coming back in the flesh. And that's exactly what John says uh, is the mark of that spirit of Antichrist. Look to yourselves, he says, that we do not lose those things 
we worked for, but that we may receive a full reward. Whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. So though the Jehovah's Witnesses claim to have the Father, that's why they call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses, reality is, according to John, in their denial of Christ, they do not have a relationship with the Father at all. They don't have a relationship with the true God in any way, shape, or form. It's he that has the Son that has the Father. That's the, that's the heart of Christianity. He that has the Son has the Father. There's no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. He said, I'm the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. Now, I know there are those who are bothered by my statement that there's no other way. They think immediately, look how narrow he is, how self-righteous he is, that he would claim that Jesus is the only way. What about the millions of people that believe that Allah is the way through the prophet Muhammad? What about the millions of people that believe that Buddha is the path to enlightenment? And follow the teachings of Buddha. They sincerely believe these things to be true. Just like you sincerely believe that Christ is the way. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You can sincerely believe whatever you want, but you can be sincerely wrong and still go to hell. Sincerity does not save you. Jesus does. And, yeah, amen. Amen. I don't mean to sound self-righteous or pompous in any way, shape, or form. But I didn't make the way narrow either. Jesus made the way narrow. He said, broad is the path that leads to destruction, and many travel thereby. In other words, the highway to hell is paved. But he said, narrow and straight is the path that leads to eternal life. And few go down it. He's the one who made the way narrow. And really, I'm glad he made it narrow. Because in making it narrow, he made it simple. It's not complicated. It's not rocket science. I don't have to figure anything out. If you made me have to figure anything out, I would mess it up. You give me too many options, I promise you, I'll fail. I will blow it every time. I'm that guy. You know the guy that, that you say, if you pick the right one of these two things, you win the lotto? I'm the guy who picks the wrong one every time. If you, if you want to win, just look at the one I'm going to pick and pick the other one. Because I guarantee you, I'm the one who picks the wrong one every time. I'm glad Jesus didn't make me have to figure out a way. He said, I'm going to make the way, and I'm going to make the way simple. All you have to do is believe in me. All you have to do is put your trust in me. And think about this. If Jesus was a way among many ways, then God is cruel and I don't want to worship him. Because if Jesus is a way, then in God sending his son to die, he did so cruelly and unnecessarily. Jesus in that Garden of Gethsemane said, as he was sweating blood and crying, said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Now, if the Father was sitting in heaven saying, well, there's a few other ways, but die anyway, what kind of God would that be? That would be a cruel God. That would be a vindictive God. That would be a God that I don't want to know in any way, shape, or form. But that's not my God. The father looked upon his son, and I'm sure the father wept too. And probably said to him, son, if there was any other way, I'd get you out of here. But there is no other way. There is no other way. But through the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the only way by which a person can be saved. He who does not have the son does not have the father. But he who has the son indeed has the Father. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. 
Now here's the nuts and bolts, the practical part of this letter from John. It's as practical, as modern, as contemporary as it gets, as relevant as it gets. What do you do when those young boys on their bicycles and their little white shirts and their ties come knocking on your door? How do you deal with that? Now, some of you say, well, I pretend I'm not home. I turn off the TV and I hide. Why? Well, why do you do that? Are you afraid of them? Oh, they might talk about their false god. Do you know what you believe? If you know what you believe, then you don't have to fear them accidentally converting you. I just don't like confrontation. Well, you know what? Nobody likes confrontation. But their souls are in jeopardy. They're perishing. They're believing a lie. Maybe you're the one who's going to put the question mark in their head that's going to make them say, oh, question mark? <laughs> Should I be doing this? Is this? Am I confused? I better study this. Hey, I used to have a guy in my home fellowship before I was pastoring who, who was an ex-Mormon who said he went to someone's house on a mission and, and the guy pulled out the book of Galatians and started teaching the book of Galatians and he said every doctrine the Mormon church teaches differently he was showing me in the book of Galatians was wrong and, and, and he was like I, I was I didn't get saved right away he said but I, I, I was just bothered by it and I went to my uh, bishop and and he basically shooed me out of his presence and said, you know, stop listening to that stuff. And, you know, and I thought, stop listening to the Bible. And I was, he said, I finally ended up having to leave. So you never know. Maybe you're the one who's going to plant that question mark in their head. Don't hide from them. Answer the door. But this is the point that John's dealing with. This is the point where you need to be careful. He says, do not greet them. That doesn't mean don't say hi. In, in the King James, I like the translation better. He says, don't bid them Godspeed. In other words, when you send them off, don't say, and God bless you, brother. Because when you say God bless you, you know, some of us speak fluent Christianese, and we do it on autopilot. We don't even think about what we're saying sometimes. God bless you. Some of you think that's a witnessing tool. That if you say God bless you to somebody, they're automatically going to get enough God to get saved because you said God bless you as you were leaving. You know, and, and hey, you know what? Take what you can get, right? If you get three words to share, say God bless you, and maybe that'll open their, uh, their interest up enough to hear the gospel from somebody else. You know, but, but nonetheless, you have to be careful how you use that because God bless you actually has some meaning. It's a weapon. It's a tool in your arsenal. When you're saying, God bless you, it's not just because somebody sneezed. What you're saying is, may the Lord pour favor upon you. May the Lord do something special for you. And when you tell that guy at your door, God bless you, what you're saying is, may the Lord help you send people to hell with your lie. May the Lord use you to lead others in deception that they may perish for eternity in the flames of hell. That doesn't sound so pretty, doesn't it? You know, but that's what you're saying when you say God bless you. So John says don't do that. Don't send them off with a God bless you. I, I would caution you also, be careful about inviting them in. Now, I'm not saying never invite them in. I, I've actually invited some in and sat down and sat with the Word and said, let's look at it. Let's consider what you're teaching here. And, and tried to witness to them, never really effectively, uh, because they don't come with a mind to listen. They come with a mind to teach, and they're trained that if you try to convert them, you're of the devil, you're demon-possessed. And, and so, uh, so they, they're, uh, you know, they're not there to learn from you. But I've tried, you know. But what I'm saying is be careful about doing that. And I'll tell you why. You could end up being, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, 
uh, when you aid and abet someone uh, in a crime, what is it? An accomplice. You could end up being an accomplice to their lie. I had these guys come over to my house once, and, and, you know, my neighbor at my old house, she used to come to the church here, and her husband was unsaved, and, and so we were constantly ministering to them, and these guys came over in their little white shirts and their ties, and, and they came walking from over next door. And they came over and greeted and said, oh, we just had the loveliest time with your neighbor, Patty, and they invited us in, and we just had the best time talking for the last several hours. Now, had I not known better, I would have thought, oh, well, Patty's one of those Christians, and she's over there enjoying their company for hours, so they must have something worth hearing. And I could have invited them in and been caught up in the lie. They used her. They were name-dropping and using her as a way to get into my life. And how much more had I invited them in? Would they have done that to my neighbor who is lost and who I was witnessing to all the time? If they went over there and said, yeah, I was just over there with your neighbor, the pastor. And yeah, oh, yeah, we had the best time. He fed us lunch and we chatted and laughed and oh, what a good time. You know what that would have said to the neighbor? Oh, he's just like the neighbor. So I better, I'll probably invite him in. And, and, and it would have opened the door for them to share the lie with him. So you never know what that's going to do. And so when you open your door to them, hey, share the love of Christ with them. Tell them the truth, but then send them off. And don't say, God bless you. Instead say, may the Lord open your eyes to see the lie that you have embraced. May the Lord stop you in your tracks and keep you from doing anything effective with your lie. May the Lord send the hounds of heaven after you and make your life a living hell until you trust in Jesus. Okay, maybe not that far. But, <laughs> but you know, I mean, hey, don't, don't. Say, will the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine upon you. No, don't do it. Because you are setting yourself up for trouble. When you greet him, when you send him off with a blessing, you share in his evil deeds. Having many things to write to you, he says, I don't wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. I find that absolutely amazing because John is saying, I could keep writing, but instead I'm going to stop here. A, a, a standard parchment was about 8 by 10, about the size of a regular piece of paper, 8 and by 11. And, uh, and, and each of his letters, 2nd and 3rd John, would fit on one piece of parchment. It's like he got to the end of the page and thought, I could go to the next page, but I'm going to stop here because I'd rather go see him face to face. I'd rather go chat. In his 90s. He was in his mid-90s. And you didn't just jump on a plane back then and fly somewhere. You went by horse or you went by carriage or you went on foot. Sometimes walking for four and five days to get to the neighboring town. And John was in his 90s and said, I'd rather do that than sit here and write a letter. Well, we could learn a lot from John. See, John said he wanted to speak face to face with them because he wanted their joy to be full. That's what God wants for you fullness of joy. And fullness of joy is directly connected here to the fellowship that we have one with another. You know, we live in a day and age where we would read what John was saying here about writing with paper and ink, and we would say, paper and ink? Who does that? Just tweet, John. Hashtag apostle, baby, you know. The, send, a, send a post on your, on your Facebook account or whatever people do nowadays. You know, give them an Instagram. I just learned how to Instagram last week. My daughter taught me how to do that, and I'm kind of sick with it. And I'm like, cool, dude, I am happening now. Uh, 
Hashtag hip pastor, you know. I have no idea what this stuff is. I really don't. I, I had a Facebook account once for a week. I started seeing what you guys were posting, and I closed my account because I thought this would be bad for our relationship if I really knew what some of you guys are talking about. It would be a major problem. So I said, I'm going I'm to get out of this account. And I closed out the account. And I, we have a church account. I even have a, my own Twitter account. I don't post my own Twitter posts. I went, the, uh, my son actually posts them from the radio messages. They find quotes in my messages and say, I'll, I'll post this quote. And, and say, you know, hashtag P. Jimmy. You know, he, he's posting this great quote. If you ever get a real lame one, it wasn't me. It was somebody else. So. <laughs> But, but, you know, hey, I'm, I'm tweeting. One of these days I'm actually going to start tweeting and be one of those tweety kind of guys, you know. But I, I recognize that this whole, whole online thing is important. We need this because it's how we're going to reach a world. As Greg Laurie said, it's like, a, it's like having a, a microphone hooked up to giant speakers that reach the whole world for free. You know, and, and so it's true. It's a, it's a great avenue for spreading the gospel. But I'm going to tell you something right now, especially you young guys that right now have your phones in your lap and you're tweeting stuff and Instagramming stuff right now during this message. Don't think I don't know you do that. I know you do that. I don't like it. I wish you'd quit doing that and pay attention to what I'm saying instead of posting nonsense or sending text messages to the person sitting next to you. Because I'm going to tell you something. While it's a useful tool for spreading the gospel, it will absolutely rip you off of the relationships that make for your fullness of joy. Fullness of joy is found in fellowship. Fellowship is not found online. Fellowship is found face-to-face in relationship. And I'm going to tell you, there's a generation growing up right now that is craving that. They're craving for someone to non-judgmentally sit down with them and just hear them and just love on them and just communicate with them the love of Christ. They're craving someone that will speak into their life and that will hear what's on their heart and will, will, will really have a relationship with them. And most of them don't even know they're craving that. Because when we were kids, we put up walls, emotional walls. Now they just put up electrical walls. Here, talk to my back of my palm while I tweet you. And they separate themselves through this instant messaging. Kids would rather sit in a room and text each other than actually have a conversation. Even though you can't even come close to communicating your heart in text. It's easier because you can't even come close to being judged in text. And they don't want to be judged. They don't want to be hurt. I'll tell you something, guys. You online crowd, you might be avoiding getting hurt by being online. But you're avoiding the fullness of joy that comes from fellowship. Sometimes you've got to take a chance and be hurt. Sometimes you've got to be willing to be embarrassed. Sometimes you've got to be willing to be hashtag awkward in order to build relationships and get close to one another. Fullness of joy is found in real fellowship. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. Now, if this is code speak for a church, then the congregation where he's writing from is sending a greeting to the congregation to whom he is writing. Uh, But it could just be that uh, he's there with Electra's sister, <laughs> you know, and they're greeting each other. Who knows? In the second epistle, he addressed the itinerant prophets and how to handle false ones. In the third epistle, he addresses the problem of a pastor who didn't want any itinerant prophets. He, he didn't want anybody to come guest speak at his church because he wanted all the preeminence to himself. So he says, the elder, again, John, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Now, we don't know if this is the same Gaius that that traveled with Paul, that Paul worked with. It probably wasn't, but there were a lot of Gaiuses back then. But uh, this Gaius is 
associated with the church that had the problem, the church of Diotrephes, which we'll see in a minute, and he was probably one of the leaders in that church. John says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. This is a very common health and wealth doctrine verse. This is a verse that sometimes people will uh, quote as a promise for healing, and, and they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they'll twist it a little bit, making it sound like it's God's declaration that, that the Lord desires that you prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers, uh, that it's God's wish for us to be healthy physically as we are healthy spiritually. Well, we have to remember something. This is a personal letter from the Apostle John to a man named Gaius. And it is not him saying, thus says the Lord, I want you to be healthy physically like you are spiritually. It's a benediction of John, a greeting, much like our, hey, dear so-and-so, I, I hope this letter finds you well. You know, I, I pray that you're being blessed right now. That, that, that's all it is. It's, a, it's just a cordial greeting, a friendly wish. It's a, however, being a beautiful sentiment, it's, it's not a promise for healing. That being said, it is interesting to see that there is a connection between spiritual well-being and physical well-being. There is a connection between the two. Uh, we, we, it's hard to test. You know, he, between the mental and the physical, we know there's a direct connection. Studies have shown over and over again that those in mental anguish tend to suffer physical ailments. We see stress-related diseases as the leading killer of, uh, of Americans today. Uh, it, it's all emotion that's leading to physical problems. But is there a connection between the physical and the spiritual? Well, the only study we've got showing any connection, uh, years ago Newsweek did a study in which they uh, discovered that in hospitals across the nation, there is a statistical difference in rate of recovery between people that got prayer and people that did not get prayer. People that got prayed over recovered something like two or three times as often over people that did not get prayed over. Now, is there a connection between the two? Uh, I don't think that proves it, but I think there is one for sure. In fact, Solomon, writing in Proverbs 17, said, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And we know the psalmist, when he was in sin, suffered all kinds of health problems. Read Psalm 32, read Psalm 51. He, he describes when he was hiding his sin, how his bones dried up within him, how it aged him, how it, it took a toll on him. So we know there's a, there's a connection there. We're just not real sure what it is. But I do know that if you want to be healthier physically, it's a good thing to be healthy spiritually. And even if you're not healthy physically, it's a really good thing to be healthy spiritually. For I rejoiced greatly, verse 3, when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Amen, John. I, I wholeheartedly agree with him. For a teacher of the word, there is no greater joy than to hear that those who are taught by him are walking in truth. I love when people leave the church. No, I don't love when people leave the church, but let me finish. Yeah. I love when people have to leave, like they get transferred. First of all, I love the fact that they hate leaving. And, and it's always the same thing. I hate Las Vegas, but I don't want to leave my church. I love my church. You know, but wherever they go, they land and they get plugged in. And, and I love when I hear back how they're serving and, and they're, you know, they're helping the pastor and doing this and doing that. And it's like, yes, I love that. On the other hand, I don't think there's any greater sorrow than hearing that my children are walking in a lie. When I hear about people who used to go to church here that are now involved in cults or have walked away and went headlong into the world, that breaks my heart. As it just tells me, you know, something's wrong there. 
Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Now he's talking here about how Gaius treated these itinerant prophets. They, they would come to town and, and, and Gaius would, would house them, would, would put them up for the night. And, and when they came, he would bless their socks off. He would feed them well, he would, he would give them money, he would give them clothes, he would, he would just take care of these people so that when they left and went to the next town, when they went to see John, they would say, man, that guy, guys, is awesome. He totally blessed us. Man, here we get to town, he loans us his Mustang. No, his horse, Mustang, you know. But, but, I mean, he loaned us his Mustang and, you know, and, and just blessed us the whole time. We were there, it was so awesome. And he sent us on our way with those incredible blessings. You know, they were just bragging on Gaius wherever they went because he was so incredible. I tell you what, the Bible college in the Philippines, that's the way they always greet me. I love when I get there and, and there's always a big colorful note on my door, a poster, welcome Pastor Jimmy with exclamation marks. And, and I walk in, there's always a big basket of, of chips and cookies and fruit and mango. They know I love mangoes, so they always have mangoes there for me. And, and, and in the fridge, there's always, you know, Gatorades and Coke Zeros and all this stuff. And oh, that just blesses me so much. You know what's really cool though? They didn't just start doing that when I took over the Bible college. They've been doing that for over 15 years since I first started going there. They have always just made me feel so welcome so that when I got there, I always felt like, who are these people to bless me so much? How dare they? Now I have to step it up and bless them even more or they're going to out-bless me. You know, I, they're not going to out-bless me, you know, and I go there to be a blessing to them. But you know what's really cool, guys? This is really a blessing to me. You guys do the same for our guest teachers. Carl Kirby called the other day. He was here just, what, last week or week before last? Two weeks ago, two weeks ago. And uh, he just couldn't say enough about how incredible he was, incredibly he was treated. He couldn't believe how loving you guys were, how friendly you were to him. We, we put him up in, with one of the families in the church and they spoiled him rotten. And he just couldn't believe how, how everybody treated him so well and loved him so much. And I just thought, you know what? That's awesome when someone leaves here bragging about us because of the way you treated them. They came here to bless us, and we blessed them. John told him, hey, you do well, because they went forth for his namesake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. These Itinerant prophets, they, they never took anything from unbelievers because, and they didn't have to because the believers took such good care of them. The believers took such good care of them that they didn't have to ask for anything from unbelievers. That's healthy ministry. I'm a firm believer that it is the responsibility of believers to support the work of reaching unbelievers. I believe that when we do ministry to believers here in the church, it should pay for itself. It should never be a burden financially on the church to do ministry to believers. In fact, it should always bring in money that can be used to ministering to unbelievers. That's why we don't charge for Harvest Festival. We open the doors. We spend a fortune on Harvest Festival. And we bless the community. They come in, we don't ask for a penny, we won't take a penny from them. They play, they do the games, they eat the donuts, they get the prizes, they jump on the jumpers, none of which they pay a penny for. What we do ask is that when you come, you buy dinner. Buy, buy some chili, buy a hot dog, buy a burger. Buy a shirt. Why? Because that's how we make money. It's not something that affects the unbelievers, but when you buy that stuff, it supports that work to the unbelievers. So that the unbelievers never confuse the gospel with money. Freely we receive, freely we give. We want to bless the unbelievers. We never want them to associate money and the gospel. They don't go together. 
Jesus died on the cross for me to be saved for free. I don't pay for that. I can't pay for that. I can't earn that. And so I don't want anybody to ever think, well, you know, I, I'm saved because I go to that church and I give my money. God forbid that they ever associate money with the free gospel, the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Salvation is free. And we never want unbelievers to be confused about that. I have a problem even with getting government grants. Uh, first of all, I don't like letting the camel's head in the tent. And that's what happens when you start getting government grants. Secondly, I don't like strings attached money. I don't want anybody giving me money and saying, well, you can feed the poor, but don't you tell them about Jesus. Well, I'm not helping the poor if I don't tell them about Jesus when I feed them. I'm a two-handed gospel kind of guy. Give freely. Feed them, bless them, care for them. But give them the gospel. Don't give them the gospel as a condition of receiving the goods. Feed them whether they get saved or not. Feed them whether they hear the gospel or not. But give them the gospel or you've only given them a temporary break. You've not given them life. You've not given them hope until you give them Jesus. And so I don't go for government grants. I don't take money from the world to do the work of God. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He pays for the ministry. Where God guides, God provides. Sometimes he does it through you. Sometimes he does it through other avenues. It's his money. He chooses how to get it where he wants it. And we'll leave it at that. That's what Gaius did. Uh, he took care of these guys so they could never have to take money from the Gentiles. The, uh, those who asked for money of these false prophets, of these prophets were false prophets. They, if they asked for money, they were false prophets. Today, I get concerned when, I, when people start asking for money. I tell people that speak up here in the pulpit that they're not to ask for money. Don't come up here and, and beg for money. You can come up here and state the need. You can come up here and, and tell people how they can be involved with what you're doing. But don't come up here and ask for money. Not, not that, that there's anything wrong with asking for money. I remember Robertson McQuilkin once saying, I'll never be ashamed to ask God's people for God's money to do God's work. But it's a dangerous thing when you start asking for money because people get confused. And so I don't use the pulpit for asking for money. I tell people what the need is, if they want to get involved. Hey, we don't usually even announce the price for events because I don't want people to think we're selling stuff from up here. So if you wonder, how come they announce these retreats and they never, they never share the price? Just go to the coffee shop or go look at the poster in the lobby and you'll get the price. We don't announce it here because we don't want people to think we're selling anything. Only two fifty if you act today. It's ninety nine ninety nine. You know, and we'll set throw in a set of free Ginsu knives. You know? That cheapens the gospel, and I never want to see that happen. So, so that's why we don't do that in the announcements. Freely we receive, freely give. We therefore, he said, ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers of the truth. Hey, when we support those who are out there sharing the gospel freely, and we help them, then we are fellow workers with the truth not blessing a lie, right? I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Here's an interesting guy, Diotrephes. He loved the preeminence. He wanted to be somebody so bad that he didn't share his pulpit. He didn't, he didn't let anybody else in his pulpit because they might take his glory. He even refused to receive John the Apostle. The church has its share of Diotrephes today looking for a place of power and authority, and they don't care who they have to step on to get it. Therefore, John says, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does, pratting against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. What a jerk. This guy would not only not share his pulpit, but when these itinerant prophets would come along, he refused to allow them to stay at his place. He refused to help them in any way. And if somebody in his church did help them, he kicked them out. He excommunicated them from the church. I'm putting you out because you supported that prophet. Wow, what a loser. But, you know, people like that, right? But here's what John says, beloved, don't imitate what is evil. In other words, everything in you might see a diatrophies and think, oh yeah, you like putting people out? I'll put you out, punk. 
John says, no, 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 no. Don't imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Once again, John placing the emphasis on doing over saying. It's not about saying you love God, though there's nothing wrong with that. It's about doing the things that show you love God, about doing good. The person that practices evil, no matter how smooth his tongue is, does not know God. Demetrius, though, has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. Demetrius is probably the guy who delivered this letter to Gaius from John, and Gaius probably didn't know him, so John is speaking a word on his behalf and encouraging Gaius to receive him as one of those dear, trustworthy brothers, a real itinerant prophet. He said, I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. So once again, that desire to come and visit. Now, I wish Connie was here this morning because I was thinking about her the whole time I prepared this message. Here she is in her, you know, 93 now. Is that right? And, and she's constantly visiting her sister, her brother, all her family members all over the country. And, and, and I think to myself, man, that's incredible. I mean, it, I just hit 50, and I'm having a hard time getting out of bed, and, and she just, she keeps going in her mid-90s, and here's John in his mid-90s, and he's walking for days to visit people, and saying, yeah, I can't wait to come see you, you know, and may the Lord also grant you long life and the ability to continue to have fellowship, clarity of mind, and the strength to get around until the day he calls you home. I went on a call a few weeks ago with Metro. It was a guy who died in his sleep. And he was 92 years old. And he had, been, he had a caregiver, hospice caregiver, or lady living in the house to watch over him. She said that night he was just sitting there watching his news channels, news show, and around 10.30 he said, well, I'm done. I'm going to bed. And he went and went to bed. And that night he just died in his sleep. And I thought, ah, what a way to go. Healthy until the end. Go to bed and wake up dead. <laughs> you, you just can't, you can't beat that deal. And, and that's my prayer for you. That God will give you long life and keep you healthy until the very end that you may enjoy one day just going to bed and waking up dead. <laughs> this ain't Kansas no more, Dorothy. I'm in the presence of the Lord for eternity. So, nothing but the truth. We learned seven things about the truth. First, it's important that we know the truth, the Word of God. Secondly, we need to practice the truth, not just know it, but live it. And then, don't go beyond the truth. You know, there's a danger in adding to the Word of God. Don't try to add to it. Don't try to make extra rules to be extra holy. You can't get holier than the Word of God. Don't go beyond the truth. Walk in truth. We got from Gaius, who walked in truth. Work for truth, as Gaius did. He supported those who, who shared the truth, and he welcomed truth into his house. He embraced into his life, and he was a witness for the truth, like Diotrephes or, or Demetrius, the good guy uh, who was a witness for the truth. And so, let's be those who walk in nothing but the truth until the Lord calls us home. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the things that you've shown us. And Lord, as we close this time of study, we pray for those who have yet to, yet to receive the truth of your Son, Lord, we pray for them that you would open their eyes today that they might come to that place of putting their trust in your Son. As you remain in an attitude of prayer with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you're here today and you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I have a very simple question for you. You've heard the gospel. There's no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. He's the one who died on the cross for our sins. He's the one that paid a price we could never pay. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you believe that he rose again from the dead? That he made a way for you to spend eternity with him? And if so, would you be willing to put your trust in him today? All the heads are bowed, all the eyes are closed. Believers are praying for you right now. But if you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want to give you a chance to do that. Right there in your seat. I'm not going to bring you forward or single you out. Right there in your seat, I'd love to pray with you. And all you have to do, if you want to put your trust in Jesus, is raise your hand and let me see you. Raise your hand and let me know. Pastor, that's me. I want to take that step today. I want to put my trust in Jesus. And I want to pray with you. Is this you? Just raise your hand and let me see you. Let me know. That's me, Pastor. Don't be afraid. If this is you, you make your hands go up there. And let me pray with you. Don't let fear stop you. Don't be crippled by it. Anybody at all? Are you raising your hand, sweetheart? Don't be afraid. I'll pray with you if you want to put your trust in Jesus. You want to do that? Yeah? Okay, good. Awesome. Anybody else? Can I pray with you? Just raise your hand and let me see you. Let me know. If this is you, I'd love to pray with you. Just raise your hand and let me know. That's me, Pastor. I believe these things are true, and I want to put my trust in Jesus as well. For this dear one that's raised their hand, I want to lead you in a simple prayer, okay? After I pray this prayer, I want you to repeat it after me. Make it your prayer because you believe it's true. And I'll pray slowly so you can follow along, but let's pray this prayer together. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe you paid the price for my sins. I believe you rose again from the dead. And you made a way for me to spend eternity with you. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Forgive me, for I am a sinner. Cleanse my heart. Make me new. Lord Jesus, I put my trust in you this day. And I thank you for what you've done. And Father, I thank you for this dear one and any others who prayed this prayer this morning. Lord, I pray that you would pour out your spirit upon her in power, baptize her in your Holy Spirit. Even now at this young age, Lord, give her those good gifts that you have for her. Draw many to yourself through her. Lord, send your angels to bear her up. Set your hedge of protection about her. Keep the enemy from stealing this good work that you've begun. Complete it, Lord, until the day of Christ Jesus. And Father, we love you. We pray that you would use us for your glory. Lord, that we would be your vessels of honor in a lost and dying world. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Let's all stand. May the Lord richly bless you this week. May he grant you wisdom in sharing his love. May he bring you into the path of those that need to hear the truth. And may he give you great words timely message to share with them that they might put their trust in Jesus. Three words for you. God bless you. David, send us home. It's our confession, Lord, that we are we so very
grace and mercy equals peace. Have a great day. God bless you all.